of revival and how the Spirit of the Lord so often moves unexpectedly in times of great triumph, trial and uh, God delivers his people as we saw in Second Chronicles chapter 20. We've been looking at some of these chapters which deal with the way that God blesses his people. In Acts chapter 4, I'm bypassing Acts chapter 2. I feel this morning I'd like to look at that occasion of the outpouring of the Spirit which came upon the early church when the first wave of persecution hit them. Acts 4 from verse 23. And linked to the outpouring of the Spirit, what led up to it, of course, was the prayer life that brought down this blessing of God. Matthew Henry, that quaint but excellent expositor of the word of God uh, made this principle when God intends a blessing his people he first sets them a prey and uh, although our dear chairman here Don Wardlow knew that at least I told him we'd be looking a prayer he felt led this morning too to give that excellent study on the laws of prevailing prayer of successful prayer and when God speaks twice, when the theme of the morning, the earlier meeting was prayer and the urgency and the need and the priority of prayer, and when we come, I feel that this is the message from the early hours this morning I felt I should be taking here, then God must intend speaking to us of the urgency of the need of prayer for this hour. Well, we were reminded how Peter and John have been let go from prison. So from verse 23 of Acts 4, being let go, they went to their own company. You see, birds of a feather will always flock together. They knew where to go. And reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God who hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of my servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For all the truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the people, and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of those that believed were of one heart and one soul, Neither said any of them that any of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Amen. One of the principles that emerged from the Great Reformation was what the reformers called the regulative principle of Scripture. Uh, perhaps that phrase may be somewhat new to you. We seem to have left a great deal of the teaching of those great reformers of the past. The regulative principle of Scripture. The understanding behind that phrase, that principle of the reformers was this, that everything to do with the economy of salvation ought to be regulated by scripture that no man should be expected to believe anything 
or to behave in a certain way which was not required of him by holy writ. Now, when we apply this principle, and men have tried to apply it, we try to come back to the principles of the early church to see how they did things, to look to the book of the Acts, especially for certain patterns. For instance, you preachers in the meeting, we can go back to the book of the Acts and see their pattern of their preaching. What kind of substance, what kind of material did they give to the people? And I'll sum it up in the three R's. They preach repentance towards God, redemption by blood only, and regeneration by the Holy Ghost. Uh, and this is the substance of all apostolic preaching. And so we look to the apostles' preaching as a kind of pattern for the kind of ministry we ought to be bringing to our people. Roland Allen, in, in his great treatise, Missionary Methods, St. Paul or ours, uh, you will remember that the heart of that great missionary book on strategy was to go back to the book of the Acts. How did the apostles evangelize? Where did they go? How did they behave when they took out the gospel to a pioneer missionary situation? The whole burden of Roland Allen's great classic, missionary strategy, St. Paul or ours. We can go to the book of the Acts, do I want to do this this morning? To see how they prayed. See, we have been looking here at a model prayer meeting, an apostolic prayer meeting. I, and I want to go back to this story to see if our, um, our situation today approximates anything like unto the prayers of the early church. Now, I don't, I don't know if I came to the notice board outside your church what I would expect to see. If I don't see on a notice board the time of prayer that God people will meet together, I want to ask you this question. Does a church who does not have a prayer meeting, can that be considered a New Testament church? However orthodox their beliefs about the person of Christ and the work of Christ and the teaching of Christ, Unless they are a church that's a praying people, can they be a church in the New Testament understanding? I suggest to you they cannot. They cannot. And I want to look at this prayer meeting. Let me tell you where I intend going, time permitting. I want to look at the character of their prayers. How do they pray? I want to look at the content of their prayers. And I want to look thirdly at the consequences of their prayers. What happened when they prayed? And already you can imagine that what they experienced is so often so different to what we are seeing today. We're looking then at the character of their prayers. It begins with verse, verse 24, when they heard that. What was the that? Well, Peter and John have been arrested, you remember, in this, in this passage, and they've been for healing a man, and they've been brought before the Sanhedrin. That was the greatest authority, the kind of highest court that they could have been brought to under the Romans. They were guilty of a religious offence, and the Sanhedrin had great authority. They held the Jewish system in a certain amount of fear. Because should there be any kind of rebellion against the council of the Sanhedrin, they used to excommunicate the Jew. And a Jew who was excommunicated really had no place in Israel at all. No one would employ an excommunicated Jew. He couldn't worship. He became, as it were, a moral, a spiritual, a social leper. No one could have anything to do with him. And so it was a very serious thing not to listen to the edict of the Sanhedrin. Let me use an illustration. I think you would agree that over here, say perhaps amongst the Amish or the Amish folk, whichever you pronounced it, we have it amongst some of the river folk and so on in Britain, they have a kind of system that is a very cast iron system, it's very difficult. 
if anyone rebels against the kind of counsel and the edicts of the movement. It's very difficult for them to live unless they're in subjection to the kind of authorities. Well, the Sanhedrin was much, was much stronger than that. And they've come back and reported to their own company that never again can they preach. Never again can they heal in the name of the Lord Jesus. The faith was finished. Already there was this mountain opposition. No more spiritual activism. And it was a very perilous thing to go against that edict. And when they heard that, what was their spontaneous reaction? Did they call a church meeting and begin to say, Brethren, we are faced with something of a crisis here. We better get our protest in. We better appeal against this judgment immediately. We better get some signatures around here and get some petitions to higher authority because this so often is the strategy of the church today. It turns to man-made machinations. But spontaneously, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God and cried with one accord. A spiritual community will find the outlet of prayer the most spontaneous reaction that they have. I was with a friend of mine, he is the Right Honourable Roland Lamb. He was a leader for many years, the chairman of the Methodist Revival Fellowship in Britain. And it was the strategy of the Methodist Church to kind of lose their evangelicals in some backwater somewhere, just to silence them, get away from their influence. And they put Roland Lamb in a very difficult church, and he was warned about the difficulties of that church. And he was alarmed, he wondered how he could manage this very difficult church. And they said, when you come to your prayer meetings, I think someone said, they're all hell let loose. And so he said they had the church meeting then something came up which was already going to cause a problem. And he wondered how the Lord would lead to overrule any uprising of the flesh and of carnality. And he turned to prayer. He said, brethren, will you pray? He said, I never had a problem in that chair, in that church, as long as we always turned to prayer. I was reading some time ago that when A.T. Pearson, Dr. A.T. Pearson used to come over to stay in Britain to preach, his great friend was George Muller, that apostle of faith, and they were working together in the study one day, and, and uh, A.T. Pearson records this story against himself. He threw down his quill, the pen that he was writing with, and he says, drat this pen. And to his embarrassment and shame, George Muller went on his knees, he said, Father, Brother Pearson's pen is causing him some irritation. Will you please not allow that pen to scratch again? Explain this as you will, said A.T. Pearson. He picked up that quill and he never before nor since wrote with a more well-behaved quill. A man who spontaneously turned to Father to pray about everything. Now, oh, I'm going to say this as sensitively as I can and being somewhat of an insensitive person. But if you're a professing Christian, say, I've got a problem. I've got a crisis. It isn't as bad as the book of the Acts here. But I've got a wayward daughter, I've got a wayward son, I've got something that's burdening me. Is your voice heard in prayer amongst the people of God? Have you asked the church to take this thing upon their heart and to pray for you? Do you make prayer a spontaneous reaction to your problems? You've got this family problem. You've got this acute temperamental problem. Are you making it a matter of prayer? Or are you just waiting for things to re resolve themselves? The character of their prayers is that they prayed spontaneously. Spontaneously, when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God and said with one accord, the character of spontaneous prayer. But I want you to notice something else. When they began to pray, 
Those of you that have got what you might call a, a marginal reference Bible, notice against all the phrases that they prayed. They lifted up their voice to one, God, to, with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God who hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. A quotation of Exodus 20 verse 11, you notice from the margin. Who but a mouth of thy David has said, and then you turn to this reference, and you'll find that this comes from various passages of the Old Testament scriptures again. And then they come to Psalm 2, the kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers are gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ and so on. Every phrase, every expression that they brought was really an extraction of Old Testament scripture and an applying of that scripture to their present day, present day experience. Now, I'm trying to be sensitive as hard as I, I can. Would we say that the character of our prayers are scriptural in their content? Notice, they didn't just take the words of the Old Testament and quote them at lib. They were most incredibly fitting to their situation. They were so saturated with the principles of Scripture that when they had a need, it was the, scripture, the scriptural principles that were, being, that were being unfolded and being brought to bear upon their situation. You see, the truly sanctified soul, the spirit-filled believer, is also filled with a knowledge of the scriptures. You know, uh, this was a problem to me. And it still is. I was challenged sitting there this morning on the laws of prayer. And when that dear speaker was saying that he felt guilty, I want to tell you, friend, I love prayer. He said, I'm a kindergarten. I'm in the kindergarten. And I'm very much in the kindergarten. I felt like almost standing to my feet and say, if you want to do anything for me, try and pray that I might be a man or woman of prayer. My in-laws, by the grace of God, Geo Fraser and Mrs. Fraser, they were intercessors above everything else. I knew no one who could so speak on prayer as they would speak on prayer. But I was finding it a problem in my quiet time. And at that time, a little tract came into my hand. It was written by George Miller that I've just quoted. And it was advice to young Christians on the prayer life, which was entitled, Pray On, Pray On, Pray On. But what I found was special value in that booklet on prayer by George Miller was this, the place of the scripture, the word of God in our meditation. I felt the first time I saw a man on his knees reading the Bible in a prayer meeting, I thought he was being irreverent. But now I see the place and the value of scriptures in our prayer time. If you don't feel you're getting through, as it will with direct, in you, scriptural promises and various things from scripture. And at the same time, I came across a book by Samuel Chadwick, the famous Dr. Samuel Chadwick, called Pathway to Prayer. And that was also a book of instruction on the prayer life. And chapter 5, chapter 5, the word of God and prayer. We need never be ashamed to bring the word of God and make our prayers scriptural praying. The character of their prayers is that it was spontaneous prayers and they were scriptural prayers and they're praying thirdly. You notice, I want to suggest to you, it was sublime praying. Let me explain what I mean. Now, I may get into a little bit of hot water with some of you. You say I shouldn't judge prayers. Well, yes and no. I've been in the pastorate for 21 years before I came out on a travelling ministry. And I would say I was in a measure concerned about people who had walked with the Lord Jesus for a number of years. For a number of years. But when they prayed, they were just babes in prayer. Now by this I mean, their prayers had expressions about them. For instance, a dear saintly woman, she always commenced her prayers with dear Jesus. And there's always a baby kind of construction prayer. Now for a child that would be fine. In case you think I'm wrong, I want to make a challenge to you. Take 
any of the prayers of Scripture, not only the Lord Jesus in John 17, but any of these men of prayer, Ezra chapter 9, Daniel chapter 9, Jehoshaphat 2, Chronicles chapter 20, any of these great prayers, and they're always big in their praying, like these young Christians are. They've barely been converted but a short time, many of these people. But when they prayed, they were sublime in their praying. You notice as you analyze their prayer, and it does lend itself to analysis, you find that immediately they begin by reminding God that he was the creator of all things. Very rarely have I heard Christians magnify the Lord, that he had made the flowers and the hills, and all the earth was his. They began with with reminding God that he was the creator of all things and they go on to praise God and they recognize in their prayer that God was a trinity in verse 27 you've got the father the son and the holy spirit all being joined together in their praying they go on to remind God that they believed that he was the inspirer of scripture and verse 25 is an acknowledgement that scripture was divinely inspired by God they acknowledge in verse 28 that God God was sovereign, that everything was the working out of his hands, because even these men would only do whatever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. They caught up with God's greatness and his grandeur and his holiness and his power and his majesty. Now, God, what about these small fry down here? You can't be afraid of man when you've had a glimpse of the glory of God. This is sublime praying. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Oh, we jump in, Lord, I've got a problem. And we never stop to think about the person of God and the praise of God. We are just dominated with our problem. And this problem is a great mountain. But they had a great God and only molehills of problems. There's the character of their praying. May God help us to pray likewise. If we want the kind of things that they received, we have to pray as they prayed. It was spontaneous prayer. They just immediately turned to God in prayer. It was a prayer that was scriptural. They knew what God required of them because they were immersed in the principles of scripture. It was sublime praying. It was to do with God in all his offices and character. But now we come to the content of their prayer. And if the Lord had never allowed us to examine prayer, you know, we couldn't do this. My dear brother was dying. And in a sense of urgency, when I went to see him in the London hospital, I prayed for him. And I don't know what I prayed. I knew it was in my heart. And when we stopped praying, my eldest brother said to me, Oh, he said, Douglas, that was lovely. Write it all out for me, would you? I couldn't have told you the content of my prayer. I did my best for him and it seemed to have helped him. But what an amazing prayer this is. I suggested to you that it's a prayer that lends itself to analysis. It's here in concrete terms what they wanted. Some of our prayers are so vague and so nebulous and so general that if you ask the person after what did you pray for, well, they prayed for so much they were not asking for anything. But here, everything they asked for was concrete, it was absolute, it lent itself to analysis. We look at the contents of their prayer and we find at least three very surprising things. I suggest to you that first of all they were praying for an aggressive spirit. They said in verse 29, Behold their threatenings. And that was a very severe threat. Let's not minimize the power of the Sanhedrin in ancient Israel. Behold their threatenings and grant unto us boldness that we may preach thy word. They sing, Lord, the biggest power in this land have ordered us, instructed us, 
that we are not to preach again the name of the Lord Jesus. Give us power to preach that name. That's an aggressive spirit. And you notice it was the very boldness, the spirit of boldness that they saw with Peter and John that got them into trouble. That when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they knew that they had been with Jesus. The very thing that got them into trouble, they said, Lord, we want more of this holy boldness. Now, a Christian can have a wrong, he can have a wrong aggressive spirit, but we must have the right aggressive spirit. Listen, friends. In the day of Augustine, that famous father of the Church of North Africa, the might of the Roman army determined to expunge every trace of a Christian. It was a religio illicita. It was illegal to be a Christian, punishable by death. And multitudes of Christians were dying in a most horrific way at the hand of Rome. What did Augustine write to the emperor? Send your troops against us. And we will blunt the very edges of their swords with our bones. <laughs> hey, would I say that today? My, I had a little bit of a bruise here. I fell against a car. Poor little me. I'm almost ready to be nursed. I don't know about wanting the Roman swords to be blunted against my bones. Yours, holy aggression, if you like. Martin Luther could see the truth of justification by faith only. And some of his dearest friends came up to him at the time when he was seeing and beginning to proclaim this. And they said to Martin Luther, Brother Martin, the whole world is against you. And quick as a flash, he says, then I am against the whole world. Does it matter if every demon in hell, if every liberal theologian doesn't go along what we believe in? If we know this to be the revelation of God, we must have a spirit of holy boldness. And surely it's a mark of every revival movement when a saint of God is filled with the spirit. There is given this aggressive spirit, this holy boldness granted to us boldness, irrespective of the cost irrespective of the punishment we want to preach the truth as it is in Christ Jesus they pray for an ag aggressive spirit and secondly they prayed for an active saviour if in verse 29 you've got the aggressive spirit give us boldness in verse 30 they say Lord stretch forth thine hand what's the hand? the hand is that which works God can speak with his voice. But that's when he communicates his revelation to his people. But the kind of scriptural expression is that when God wants to do something, they want the right hand of the years of the Most High. They want the power of God to be unleashed upon them. Do you know what it seems to me that we're not seeing very much of in these days? We're seeing it to a measure... And we don't despise the day of small things, but surely we look for much greater things. We want to see the hand of God being made bare. And here were multitudes being saved at this time. The church was being multiplied, but they wanted the arm of the Lord to be revealed. Do you remember during the Wesleyan era? The multitude of souls that were being blessed and being brought into the kingdom. Yet when they got together, they would cry as they sung, Arm of the Lord, awake, awake, and put thy mighty strength on. They wanted an active saviour. Don't always think that God has to work according to the ways you think he ought to be working. But when God is pleased with his people, there should be the activity of God in the midst of his people. And they wanted an active saviour. Thirdly, not only did they pray for an aggressive spirit, verse 29. Not only for an active saviour in verse 30. But also in verse 30 they prayed for a testing sign that signs and wonders may be performed in the name of the Lord Jesus. I know you're listening. 
And you know, this accent of mine didn't come from Pennsylvania or down in Kentucky or Texas down there. I come from the other side of the water. And uh, in our country, we have a great number of evangelical ministers. There are some very fine men. But what I have been saying from time to time is that the, the overriding doctrine that's prevailing in our churches at the moment, in so many of our evangelical churches, are the five points of Calvinism. Total depravity and unconditional uh, election and a limited atonement and irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints. And uh, these men are committed to what they called a reformed position. And of course, two of their great schoolmasters are the famous... I cannot believe from the word of God that the age of signs and of wonders are over. As long as there's a Holy Spirit who will be poured out upon his people, you will see the display of the power of God and the nothingness of man and that signs and wonders will be continued to be performed in the name of the Lord Jesus until we see him face to face. That's the day when that which is perfect is come. It's the return of the Lord. We won't need the ministry of the supernatural, of the miraculous yet. And somehow in my heart, I believe strongly we must see more of the return of the supernatural for those who cannot be healed by cancer by the doctors to be healed by the name of the Lord Jesus for broken and shattered lives these alcoholics these drug addicts who can't be treated the broken marriages the messed up lives of all the sexual indulgence it must be a miracle a miracle of grace performed by the Holy Spirit that alone can deal with these poor people we must ask the Lord for attesting signs that signs and wonders may again be performed in the name of the Lord Jesus. Let me ask you this. Has there ever been an outpouring of the Spirit? Has there ever been any revival of religion without attesting signs? Do you know some of these signs are so incredible that in almost every revival the instruments that were used found it wiser not to record them because of the offense that they were to the people of God. Talk about a testing sign. I was almost tempted to say some of the things that were witnessed in the Hebrides revival. And in the Welsh revival. But some of them are almost too difficult to explain. How can a man, how can a company of people, you know that spirit of praise we had for some minutes at the commencement of the service. How can that Continue for ten days and ten nights with seemingly a complete a kind of stopping of all natural functions other than the spirit of praise. But that's how it happened in the Welsh Revival. A testing sign. <coughs> the content of their prayers, they prayed for an aggressive spirit. Grant us boldness. They preached for an active stray saviour. Stretch forth thine hand. They prayed for attesting signs. Let signs and wonders be performed in the name of thy holy child Jesus. And seemingly perhaps they stopped praying. I should imagine perhaps the whole atmosphere of that prayer meeting became pregnant with a sense of expectancy. But then already there was the beginning of the answer to their prayers. They were prayers that had consequences. Something happened and I'm sure we can only expect the kind of consequences that these people experience when we pray according to the kind of character of the prayers that they prayed. What were the threefold consequences I want to mention? First of all in the next verse, verse 31. Divine agitation. The place was shaken. I remember preaching on revival once in a church. It was my own church and some of the deacons said, but pastor, if God was to shake us, what would happen to the ceiling and to the plaster? <laughs> By the way, a dear friend of mine told me that during the Welsh revival, he took me to a church. He told me, I, I, I don't know if it's true. He told me that crowds of people came to see that church because it visibly shook continually under the power of the Spirit. 
You've probably heard Duncan Campbell say time and time again that in the moment that the spirit fell upon the Hebrides, the island shook. People's jugs shook on the place where the spirit fell. There was a divine agitation. The place was literally shaken. But that's not my concern. Amen. Now we're fairly free. Praise God. We are free to worship. And yet I feel that every one of us still needs to be shaken by the Lord. Amen. Some of the chains may be still around us a little. And you may be looking at a rather formal... Welshman from over there. We need a bit of a shaking and those divine agitation the place was shaking. Yes. And people sit up and take notice when there's a shaking. Nobody takes any, any notice of a cemetery. But if a cemetery began to shake a little they start looking in to see what's happening. You heard about that poor lock that was passing through the cemetery and fell into the empty grave and couldn't get out. It was all muddy and another poor lock was coming along later and he heard this cry for help and when he went to the side, it was the mat. He said, oh, he said, get me out, get me out, I'm all cold. So of course you are, you silly fool. <laughs> you start taking notice if the dead begin to stir a little. We need to be shaken that is to wake you up a little down there. <laughs> Shake us, O oh Lord. Amen. Shake us with thine almighty breath. That the world might know something of thy divine power. The place was shaken. There was divine agitation. Yes. There's something else. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak there was divine ability <coughs> yes. I've suggested this perhaps not here but before I came here no Christian has the warrant to say I can't because whatever the Lord would have us to perform he gives us the power to enable us to do it they were all filled with the Holy Ghost incidentally you know this, of course, that these are the same people who were filled with the Spirit. The times the Apostle Paul was filled with the Spirit, but being filled with the Spirit, he was again filled with the Spirit. Oh, isn't it marvelous? There's no once for all filling. That being full, we can be filled and filled and filled again. And so they cried that there might be this, this endowment and there was divine ability. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. But they, you know there's something here that's often overlooked and I think this is great too. In my judgment greater than verse 31 where they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Is also this consequence of their prayers in verse 33 where not only was there great power, this divine ability, whereby they gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, but this is what I like. Great grace. Mm. Divine approval. I've got children. Perhaps I can be sitting in the room, I'm thinking of one at the moment. And her fingers go over that keyboard. And I talk think about ability. She's got the ability. But there are things that I do not approve of. And I just had a lovely letter. She says, Dad, you know, I don't want to do these things. If it's causing grief and harm, there are things we were not too happy about. She says, I don't want to, I won't do them then. But had she persisted? She could have had the ability. And perhaps I'd be looking at it and, and recognizing the ability. But in my heart I would just covet. I wish she had my approval with the kind of life that she was living. And God wasn't only giving the power. There was his well done. There was his amen upon their lives. Great grace was upon them all. And what we need more than the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of power and a revival is also for the Lord to say you are my people and I'm so aware of the sweetness of communion and relationship that we have, that we have his divine approval. You husbands and wives, 
You're sitting in these lovely rocker chairs you have over here in the States, one here and one there, and he's reading the paper and she's knitting or crocheting. And there's no words being spoken. But, you know, he would say there's a sense of, of lovely contentment of the relationship with my wife, and she might say there's crocheting here is a lovely sense of oneness of relationship with my husband. Or there's nothing being said, and she might have to say to him, she said, darling, what's wrong? Well, well, there's something that's not, not right, is there? You see, there's an internal, there's an inward assurance, an inward witness that the relationship is one that's satisfying and full and complete and it has the approval of the one of the other. And you know in the home if that isn't there. And likewise spiritually, in our hearts there's a kind of witness that there's no cloud. We are one with him, I am my beloved's and my beloved's mine. He brought me to his banqueting house and his banner over me is love and you just have that assurance that, that you're right with God and you should look for that approval of God more than anything else. And I'm not here to whip you if you haven't got that. I just want to plead with you. If you're conscious there's something not right, put it right. Have it put right in order that you know that you've got the divine approval. What was the consequences of their prayer? There was divine agitation. Power came place was shaken and with great power they witnessed to the resurrection from the dead of Jesus Christ their Lord there was divine agitation there was divine ability they were all filled with the Holy Spirit there was divine approval great grace was upon them all that was apostolic prayer May God cause us to pray likewise.